we are um, in, uh, been, we've been talking about um, the firstborn and then we got into Adonai and Adonai is the basic overseer, the firstborn, particularly when he is in the corridor or going through the sufferings of Christ. Well, then we've gotten into a, sh I mean, for me, a short little thing that we'll be getting into for a couple of weeks uh, in the prophets. <clears throat> and last week was our first class. And, um, and what we did was we saw that um, uh, there was a, <clears throat> a, a picture of uh, two baskets and one of them was full of bad figs another one good ones and the bad figs were were Judah who would not be with God in these sufferings and who rebelled against it and they wanted their freedom and they didn't want any sufferings and they didn't want any problems and they wanted everything to be glorious and wonderful <laughs> praise God the other ones and you can read it it's right there what is that uh, Jeremiah 24 uh, Anyway, and the other ones were the ones that the Lord said, I will bless you and I will give you a heart. And I believe you end up getting that heart by being in those sufferings, by being in that corridor with him and learning the spirit of the Lord in relationship to the lamb and in relationship to his true eternal spirit, lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Wow, my arm just went through a rock. Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And um, uh, at, at the end, uh, lamb, slaughtered lamb on the throne. So, um, the eternal Christ and his nature. And uh, then we went into another chapter there. If I remember correctly, maybe we didn't. <clears throat> anyway, we're going to be in chapter 26 now of Jeremiah. And uh, we're... <clears throat> What we, what we got in the figs, the two baskets, was we got kind of a parable of, of those who are gods who are going to be with him. It's, like, it, it's a little bit like this. Those who will follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Now, we see in the book of Revelation, right off the bat, you know, that there are worshipers of the Lamb, and they're worshiping, and they're, you know, glory to the Lamb that was slain. And that, that's, they didn't say glory to the Lamb that was raised. Glory to the Lamb that was slain. And uh, all glory to the slaughtered lamb, and um, uh, and and that was a great multitude. But you get down into chapter fourteen, and you get one hundred forty-four thousand. And these are different; these are they which will follow him whithersoever he goeth. All right. So, um, so we're getting these parables in Jeremiah, and we're going to sort of get another one. It's actually a true story, but uh, but it's going to be. A parable of that same thing, the same thing with the figs, the same thing with uh, uh, with uh, what we call the corridor of suffering in First Peter, all the way through First Peter, and, and that. So let's let's do that. Uh, this is Jeremiah 26, and we'll start at verse one. Um, let's see here. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Joash, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. So he's speaking to the worshipers. He's speaking to the ones who claim that they're really going there, and they we go to the house of God. We're really of God. And he's speaking to them, okay? All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way. And so you'll see that phrase or, or, or a similar phrase a lot from the Lord and all of the prophets, that he gives a warning uh, and his, his motive is always, if so be that they will turn. If so be that they will turn. That's his desire. His heart's desire. We say, his desire is that we turn from sin. No, turn unto him and be with him in his spirit. Fellowship with him in his sufferings, as, as uh, Paul talks about in Philippians uh, chapter 3. So, um, 
that that I may repent of the evil which I purpose to do unto them. That he's not wanting to do this. <laughs> He's not wanting to do this, okay? Um, which I purpose unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I send unto you, both rising up early and sending them, uh, but you have not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh. Okay? God removed his presence from, from Shiloh, okay? And I will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Okay, now verse 7. Uh, and let me just say this from the onset. The vast majority of this chapter, as I said, it's about two men. It's only about two men primarily. Um, the first part is mainly about Jeremiah. He's one of the men. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> verse 7. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now, it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests, this is the religious people, the people who should know the Lord, that the priests... Um, and the prophets, and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. All right. So, this is... Jeremiah pretty much knew most of the time that he was in trouble if he was going to speak this stuff. Okay. He knew. He knew. But he also knew that this was the Lord, and from the Lord. And he knew what the people didn't know. They heard the words of warning. They heard the words of uh, that sounded dreadful. But Jeremiah knows that behind all of those words, the Lord wants fellowship. He wants us to fellowship with him in his sufferings. He wants us to be after his kind. He wants us to to function by the divine nature. He wants us all of those things. All right. So, verse 10. When the princes, okay, so over here we had the the uh, the priests and the prophets and all the people. But verse 10, when the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Well, this is interesting. These guys ain't even going to church. <laughs> the princes, and yet they're going to be the helpers. And all these religious titles of, of um, priests and prophets and all that, there, the Lord didn't say go to the house of uh, the house of the king and speak to the princes. He said go to the house of the Lord. All right. So, um, and they sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, "This man is worthy to die." Okay, that's the that's. There's only one conclusion in their minds. You know, this guy needs to die. All right. Uh, for he hath prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. Verse 12. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me. The Lord sent me. That's the first thing. Look. Uh, you know, they got upset with, with Jeremiah, but the Lord had sent him. You can't argue with that. Or they can. To prophesy against this house. And against this city, all the words that you have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent of the evil that he had pronounced against you. Okay. Verse 14. As for me. Okay. So this is, this is really important because now you're going to get the spirit of the man you're also going to get the, the relationship that he has with the Lord. You're going, to get the, you're going to get a sense of the closeness. You're going to get a sense of that the earth is not 
the earth is not uh, where he lives, where good or bad. He lives in the heart of the Lord. And um, so, so he, he's already said, like a good prophet, you know, um, the Lord sent me and this is God speaking. But now he's going to say, as for me, okay, now as for me, behold, I'm in your hand. See, he's not trying to get out of the sufferings. He's trying to be with the Lord in them. He's not trying to uh, uh, fool them or, or, or sweet talk them or whatever. He's just saying what he heard from the mouth of the Lord. Now, isn't that what Jesus said? I, the words that I speak are not my own. They're the Father's. Mm -hmm. And what I speak, I've heard of my Father. It's a relationship. It's not just doing the prophet thing. It's a relationship, and it's a beautiful relationship. And it's and and the Lord knows it's beautiful, and He wants us to enter into that. But we don't know, or certainly the priests and the prophets and all them in this story, they don't know. But Jeremiah does. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, I'm in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and fit unto you, meet unto you. So that he says, you know, look, I mean, this is this is hard for us to do, to go, okay, you're the bad guy. I'm the good guy. So so you need to die. Uh, but but in Jeremiah's case and in Jesus's case and in Paul's case and in everybody that really knew the Lord, it, it becomes you know, look, I'm in your hands knowing that you're in the hands of the Lord. More specifically, knowing that you are in the hands of your Adonai. Okay? That's going to play a big part as we get in deeper into this. Okay? Um, verse 15, But know ye for certain that if you put me to death, you shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves. So, he knows that there's no malice in him. He's not trying to, you know, to, to get back at somebody or look down on somebody or any of this stuff. He, he knows, look, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to destroy Jerusalem and, or this house. But God said he will. You know, you, you know, you want to, you want to complain about me, take it up with my boss because, you know, this is all coming from him. Um, you innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Okay, verse 16. Then said the princes uh, and all the people unto the priests and to the pro prophets. So, so you got... You got two groups working here. You got the princes, and then you've got the priests and the prophets and all the people. The princes, though, have a higher rank. So then said the priest uh, and uh, and all the people under the priest to the prophets, This man is not worthy to die, for he hath spoken unto us in the name of the Lord our God. So they perceived that this was the Lord. Now, um, we the, we really discussed a lot last class. And if you didn't, you weren't there for last class. You really should get it, so it'll save me from having to repeat constantly. Um, but the the one of the main purposes of the book of Jeremiah, and it has uh, Ezekiel in it too, and many other prophets. Actually, actually, we'll even get into a little bit of Isaiah, even though they weren't at the same time. But the but Jeremiah. And God is using him to speak to the people about, look, I'm sending you into Babylon. I'm doing this. Um, and, uh, and his purpose was the same thing as this story, to be with him in these sufferings and not fight and, and try to get out of everything and try to declare yourself to be holy and perfect and all this kind of stuff when when look just give all that up and be with me you know but we can't because well i'm strong or i've got pride or i've got all this stuff and we've got got all those things anyway so um uh 
he sp he's spoken unto us in the name of the Lord our God. Verse 17, then rose up. So, so he's, he's relating, the princes are relating a story here of another prophet, Micah the Marashite. Uh, then rose up certain of the elders in the land and spake to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah the, the Marash, Marashite, there you go, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. So, so the prophecy apparently has been going on for a while, because Hezekiah was a while back. And, and you know, the people are still going, no, no, this house, no, 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 this city, no, 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 this land. Well, what about this God? What about his heart? How about, how about becoming his habitation instead of you worrying about a building that he gave you and, not, and you, you're not properly uh, functioning in it, see? But that's it. This is, well, you know, uh, th this is it. This is, this is uh, what's holy. And God isn't. We're being holy by standing up for his uh, bricks that have been built up into this building. But the Lord sang, and if you know anything about Ezekiel, you get to watch him slowly work his way out of that temple and he's gone. Just like he promised, I'll make this house like Shiloh. Mm -hmm. It's the word of the Lord. All right. So, um, uh, verse nine: Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all the uh, and all Judah put him to put him at all to death? The guy that said the same thing, basically, that Jeremiah is saying: Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord? Talking about Hezekiah, he feared the Lord and he sought the Lord, and the Lord repented of the evil which he had pronounced against them. Thus might we procure great evil against our souls if we if we do anything other than what good king hezekiah did and what did he do he said well if this is true you you don't even have to know if it's true you just have to say if this is true you know what if this is true lord i want to be with you I don't want to be outside. I can think that I'm all right and everything's good and I'm just perfect and all this stuff. But he's he's not he's not after your things. <laughs> he's not after your ministry. He's after your heart. And he wants your heart towards him, not what you're doing for him. <clears throat> all right. So um, verse 20. And I'm sorry if I seem to be going fast, but. You know, I'm trying to, I mean, the story is not that complicated, but there's a lot to it. Verse 20, and there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord Uriah. And uh, so uh, Uriah, the son of uh, Shimei, whatever, of Kirjath Jerim, who prophesied against this city and against this land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. So they're saying that there's this guy named Uriah, and he's he's living during the time of Jeremiah, and Jer and and uh, he's prophesying. Okay, so he is uh, who prophesied against the city, and against this land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. So he's saying basically the same thing as Jeremiah. All right, And when uh, Jehoiakim, the king, with all his mighty men and all the princes heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt, went into Egypt. And Jehoiakim, the king, sent men into Egypt, namely El El Nathan, the son of Akbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. And they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt and brought him unto Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah 
that they should not give him into the hands of the people to put him to death. So you got the same king that, that Uriah had. Uh, you got the same message that Jeremiah is speaking with Uriah. You've got all the similar situations except one. Except one. When it came to the sufferings, Uriah ran. Yeah, and people do it all the time. They just see it as, well, this is the devil, or this is somebody who's just against me. They don't have eyes to see yet that not everything is the devil, or just everybody's just against you. Many times it's the Lord, and we're rebelling against God. You know, I mean, this this light affliction worketh far us uh, a far more eternal uh, relay, uh, um, weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen in relationship to being with him in that instead of always trying to get out of it. All right, so, um, uh, so let me just read the notes now that, that are in relationship to this. Um, this whole chapter is about two men. One accepted death and the other, though saying the same thing, fled into Egypt to save himself from the suffering of death. In fact, I think I've got some notes up here I never read. Okay, well, maybe that'll be the last part. Uh, <clears throat> the first man of the story was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told to speak hard words to those who came to worship God at the temple. He ended his words in verse 4 through 6, declaring that, Though God has pronounced impending judgment, yet if they will turn the things causing the judgment, then he will not do it. Okay, so <clears throat> you have to understand that when you're talking about Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or many of the prophets, there's more than one issue, okay? There is the just the out-and-out -out wickedness of the people, but in Jeremiah and in, in uh, even in Daniel, but in Jeremiah particularly and in Ezekiel, there's also this other thing that God wants them, God wants them to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And it and they're just having a hard time. No, no, we're of God. We shouldn't be under that kind of stuff and all that. But look at look at all the people that did obey that we know who they are. You know, Daniel, the three Hebrew children, um, uh, Nehemiah, um, Esther, <laughs> um, all of those people found the Lord in a greater way than it, they were getting back there because that was a prostituted system by then. Okay? They'd lost the Lord and sold their soul out to, to a religious thing thing that wasn't it was a religious god that wasn't god if you will and so but but the ones that went the ones that went will willingly into the captivity that's where you see that god blesses them and so so just to reiterate we're going to go through jeremiah and not all of it but the main points of this area and ezekiel and we're going to see, and we'll even look in, in Isaiah to see that the principle is always the same when God's trying to deal with us. Mm -hmm. And we're blind to it and we resist the hand of God thinking that this is the devil or whatever. All right. So, <clears throat> um, um, <clears throat> so he said, if they will turn from the things causing the judgment. Well, in this case and in the area I'm sharing in, the things causing the judgment isn't all the wicked things that they're doing. It's the fact that they are rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and they're rebelling against Jeremiah who's saying, God said to submit. So they're rebelling, rebelling against God. All right. And, and worse, worse. How many of us have read Philippians and read, you know, know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and being made conformable unto his death? Well, we have 
we've all been schooled, you know, either by me or someone else, about being made conformable to his death. Okay, we've, we've had a lot of that. But what about the fellowship of his sufferings? We, we don't even know what that is. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, we don't know the spirit behind it. We don't know the reality behind it. We don't, we don't comprehend uh, his heart. We only comprehend earth's circumstances. As long as you don't comprehend his heart and his dealing with you through troubles and trials and different things to bring you closer to him, you'll be fighting getting closer to him. Even while you're praying, Lord, get me closer. I don't know why you won't move. And, you know, <laughs> well, it's because we don't fully know. We, we need to do like Jeremiah did. Look, do whatever you want with me, you know, but I'm, I'm with, I'm going to be with the Lord in this. Three Hebrew children. Well, whether, you know, whether you're going to throw us in there or not, we're not going to bow down to this, okay? Uh, there's a spirit that stays with the Lord in whatever circumstance it is. It doesn't have to be a good circumstance or one beneficial to you. All right, so... Um, what were those, thi were those things the prophet kept telling them? Stop fighting against Babylon, but submit to Nebuchadnezzar. But if not, then their glorious temple made by Solomon will become like the tabernacle at Shiloh, meaning he will leave it and them. Leave it and them. The priests and the prophets and the people rose up and wanted to kill him, but the princes came and wanted to hear him. That's a contrast. They wanted to hear him. What does he have to say? Not, I don't, I, I can already tell. I don't like, I don't like how this sounds. I don't, I don't want to hear it. I, blah, 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 you know, um, uh, <clears throat> he told them the same words and sort of like Esther, he said, if I perish, I perish. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah did. Okay. In so many words, the princess spoke, uh, uh, to the bad people and said that he's not worthy of death. Then certain elders seemed to back Jeremiah and his mission and even that he should not be put to death. Okay, so the second man was Uriah. He also prophesied the same things as Jeremiah did, but Jehoiakim the king, uh, along with his men, sought to kill him. Uriah's response was to flee out of fear to Egypt to save his own life. This would be similar to Judah looking to Egypt to save them from the sufferings of Christ. So the king sent men to bring him back. At his return, the king killed him and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Well, I shouldn't be in the graves of the common people. You know, of course, of course Uriah didn't know it. He's already dead. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you know, but if he was alive at all, he would go, don't throw me here. This is not what I deserve. Well, it's not your mind that counts. It's his mind. The last verse closes the chapter with this remark. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. All right. So the point is, Jeremiah was in the corridor representing the sufferings of Christ. He could have resisted, covered up, self-protected, but instead he stayed there even if unto death, such as Jesus and Paul and later even Peter. In contrast, Uriah probably just thought he had taken on a preaching mission from God. He didn't see it like Jeremiah understood it to be. He preached the exact same message, message as Jeremiah, but his response in the trial was the only difference. He was not willing to trust his Adonai while in that place of his sufferings. God knows our hearts, and if we sincerely want to fellowship with him in his sufferings, or if we are seeking the prestige of another who cares nothing for it. I don't think I finished that sentence. These two men were a parable concerning those who did not fight back but trusted God versus those who sought to save them, just as in the parable of the two baskets of figs in two chapters before this one. 
And then I had a little thing written at the very beginning. So let me see what that says. Don't go into the corridor if in the end your only goal is to save your life. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> in the following historical account, <clears throat> there are only two men mentioned probably unknown to them at the time. Their lives, actions, and choices are a prophecy. Probably unknown to them at the time, their lives actions and choices are a prophecy of what is going on in the bigger picture of God's dealing with the world. Well, I mean, what if... Nah, it couldn't be. Couldn't be. Or could it? Okay. Let me see here. Maybe I can... Uh, <clears throat> I think it'd be helpful, and we got a little bit of time. Um, what it is, is the historical account of the sons of Joe, uh, the sons of Josiah, who were kings during this whole Babylonian thing. Okay. And it gives you really good good historical account, even though it's short and sweet. Um, and there are some similarities within them also. <clears throat> so let's do this. Uh, um, let's start at verse 1 through 3, and we're going to talk the eldest son of Josiah. And none of these sons turned out very well. Okay. So, <clears throat> Jehoahaz, the oldest son of Josiah. Okay, then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, there it is, <laughs> and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was twenty and three years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in a, hun uh, in a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. Okay, so this is before Babylon. All right, so who, who, who feels like they own Judah at this point? It's Egypt. Okay, it's Egypt. All right, so um, the next verse, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, verse 4 through 8, uh, halfway through. And the king of Egypt made... Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. All right. So, Jehoahaz was the oldest. Um, Eliakim, who we don't know that name very much, because pretty much when he came, became over the thing, Egypt was over them, and made him, turned his name to be uh, Jehoiakim. Okay, verse 5, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Verse 6, against him came up Nebuchadnezzar. Aha, first mention of Nebuchadnezzar. In the story of Josiah's sons, Jehoahaz, the oldest, did not have to... Um, uh, deal with Babylon. But Egypt came in and set him down uh, and made his younger brother uh, Jehoiakim, because they changed his name to that. It gets a little confusing because every one of these guys have another name. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, still in verse 4, and Nico, this is Pharaoh Nico, Famous Pharaoh, Nico number two. Um, <clears throat> Nico took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. Okay, so Jehoahaz, the oldest of Josiah's sons, is now in Egypt. Um, Jehoiakim, which is his second oldest, um, was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Okay, verse 6, against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, 
king of Babylon and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Okay, so all of this time, you, you go all the way back to Josiah, not just the sons, to Josiah. You have Jeremiah there prophesying of what's about to happen. And I remember when I was in Bible school and I was reading this, and I remember reading... Um, I remember reading in the Chronicles and the Kings about Josiah, and he was this great king, and he, he tore down the idols, and he tore down the high places, and he, he built up the, the, the temple, and they, they had wonderful services, and all these things happened. And then I remember reading in the prophets, and I went, oh my God, even, even though he was such a man of God, the people were a mess, and they were still at that very time when if you just read the historical thing, you'd go, oh, everything's wonderful, and all the people are wonderful. No, the king had a good heart, but they didn't. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, so then um, Jeremiah is prophesying all the way through all of these things, all right? And then um, verse 7, Nebuchadnezzar also carried carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple in, at Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and his abominations which he did and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. All right, now let's go. This Jehoiachin is actually not one of the sons of Josiah. He is the son of Jehoiakim, the guy that we just read about and and uh, got carried away to Babylon. Um, so this is verses 8b to 10b. That's how, you know. Um, and this is the second deportation. The first one was with Jehoiakim, and I know there's a lot of information here, but, but this will help you if you just read uh, Jeremiah 27. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Second Chronicles 36. Okay, I'm sorry. I got second. This has all been in Second Chronicles 36, uh, and Second Chronicles 36 is what we're reading, and it chronicles all of the deportations. Okay, and they're divided uh, almost perfectly. They usually have an A and B part. So um, Second Chronicles 36. Uh, Okay, so that's the, this is the second deportation. And Jehoiachin, his son, Jehoiachin was Jehoiakim's son in his stead, not Josiah's son. Jehoiachin was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So this is the same, it's the same story. Each one of these kings, and this is leading up fast to the Babylonian captivity. And the whole time, Jeremiah is prophesying the same stuff. Look, you guys need to come under the yoke. You need, instead of being kings and, and all you princes and all you, you priests and all that, you need to become sons of God by Christ, you, by the Lamb. So, um, um, and he was, uh, uh, when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord. So this is Jehoahaz, the oldest. Egypt took him away. Jehoiakim, next oldest. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came down, took him, and took a bunch of the stuff from the house of the Lord. Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim, uh, does the same kind of junk. And so uh, Babylon, or, uh, Nebuchadnezzar sends somebody else to come down and carry him away also to Babylon and still listing a bunch of vessels from the house of the Lord that are going. Okay, not done yet. There's one more, there's one more son, Zedekiah, and he was the youngest of them. Still in Second Chronicles, and I'm sorry for not giving y'all the right thing. I thought I did. You know, you get going, you think you know something, and you don't. I admit it. I'm an idiot. Um, Second Chronicles 36, and this is 10b, the b part of it. Uh, and the king of Babylon made 
Zedekiah, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Um, that threw me a little bit, but um, Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah. See, Jeremiah is, is continually telling them, and that's why we're going we're gonna to read all that stuff in Jeremiah. But now you're getting the history, and you know it's coming now, because he's not listening to Jeremiah at all. Uh, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. The, can it get any more clear, folks? He's, he's rebelling against the word of the Lord that says, submit to Babylon, go, go into Babylon. Uh, you know, originally it wasn't you would have to go into Babylon, just become a, uh, underneath him. But all that rebellion, he said, I'll just carry you away. So he did. Um, and, uh, and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathens, and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes uh, and um, sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought up them, uh, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans, that's Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, um, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and uh, had no compassion upon young me man or maiden, old man or him that stooped of age. He gave them all into his hand, the king of Babylon, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and the treasures of the princes, all these brought he. This is the third, this is the third deportation, and the last one. Every time, on all three of them, every time, he'd go in and plunder, plunder the house of God and take more out of it. Say, this is all going to Babylon. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, and what did he do on this one? I don't know if, remember if it says here, but the, on this deportation, the last one, he burned the temple to the ground. All right. So verse 19, and they burnt the, <laughs> there it is. And uh, verse 19, and they burnt the house of God and break down the walls, wall of Jerusalem and burn all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill, to fulfill, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. All right, so that's a, the Sabbaths is another another reason uh, you, you have. Well, let's stick with the one that we're on right now, and that is one of the main reasons was because God was trying to do something in them as a people. And that was bring them into the fellowship of his sufferings and learn to be a lamb instead of a, a lion. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when they turn, they see a lamb. Oh, my God, we missed it. You know, uh, so that was one of them. Another one was they had um, they had uh, missed 70 years of Sabbath as far as the land was concerned. They had not let the land lay fallow. And God said, I'm going to keep you there for 70 years so that the land can lie fallow and gain nourishment and renew itself and, you know, and, and, and uh, eventually get back, you know, if you're a farmer, you know all about this, um, and, and let the, the land get back to where it can grow fruit again. And spiritually, 
Christianity doesn't do that. Everything, we just keep going. We don't have any time out. We don't have a year of rest or any of that kind of stuff. And people say, well, where'd you get this idea for a year of rest? This is where I got it from. So that the land can enjoin its Sabbaths. And then one of the third ones is, we'll just say something to do with the, the burnt offerings, the morning and the evening sacrifice. All right, so... All right, so here's what uh, I suggest. Because uh, if, if, if you don't know all this, I suggest you go back to um, Second, Second Chronicles 36, and you, all you have to do, let's see, yeah, down to verse 21, verse 1 to 21, and you'll find all of the information that I just talked about when it came to these different kings, these different sons of Josiah. And it's good information. It's short. It's concise. You don't have to search the whole Bible over to get a feel for the deportations and the different kings that just keep reacting. <clears throat> uh, so do that. And then for next time we get together, uh, go to Jeremiah 21. And um, And we, yeah, so we'll go all the way to verse, well, we'll do the whole chapter, I guess it is, down to 22, Jeremiah 21. And if you read that, then you're going to um, get some of the parts that I said that I didn't have it as proof in the scriptures, like last week and a little bit this week. You're going to get some of that fulfilling. You're going you're gonna to read it and you're going to go, there it is. Now, I think some of the stuff we read to, today, tonight, was good because it shows you that this thing has to do with submitting to Babylon, and God wants that. You go, well, he was an ungodly man. Okay, see, that's your problem right there. <laughs> You're too religious to serve, to be low. You got to be high. You got to be more righteous. You got to look better. You got to be puffed up. You got to be you got to be leavened bread that's puffed up and everything. God says, I don't want any, you know, leaven in my house. But we're, it's full. It's, pride is everywhere. All right, so let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for uh, your heart. And, um, and your heart, as we see from Jeremiah, is never just to destroy us. Your heart is never just to be angry over something and, and in fact, it is the exact opposite. You are pleading. And how many times have I read that you pleaded with the people? You pled with the people. You, you, you did. You did that. Lord, you shouldn't have to do that. We should hear you. We should be with you. We should honor you. We should want whatever you say, Father. We shouldn't have a Christianity that is so formed in us that makes it almost impossible to be with you in these ways while you cry out for it even then and even now. You cry out for it. You long after it. Father, I just pray that, that even the seeds, even if they've been so sparse of First Peter, can begin to take hold and we begin to truly comprehend what you were trying to tell us all along this exact same line. So help us, Lord, by your Spirit. You gave us your Holy Spirit. You gave us the Spirit of God to guide us into all truth, not truths, not deep Bible facts, but all truth of your heart the things that are true in your heart. So, Father, we, we love you. We love your Son. We love the Holy Spirit. Put us on a basis that we can receive that. Father, sadly, a lot of times it takes crisis where we, we would be humbled to a place that we can't do anything else but be humbled. But that's not even your way. Your way is to get us where we will understand your heart and will be with you the, in the beautiful way that Daniel was, 
or the beautiful way that Esther was, or the beautiful way that Nehemiah was, or Ezra, Father. Father, Father. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.